Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was, to put it mildly, an incredibly, incredibly nice intro. Thank you, Jack. Um, I'm not sure I'm fully deserving of, of all of that, but I appreciate it. I also realize it's Memorial Day, and um, and it's a you know it's a holiday, and you guys took the took this day to come out here and hear me speak, so I appreciate it very much. I know you could be out there doing something really fun with your families, um, but I, I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, I um, wrote the Kite Runner back in, finished it in, back in uh, January of 2003. Um, and it, you know, as, as some of you may have read that novel, it's, it was set in a world of men. Uh, it was essentially a love triangle between these two boys and the father character, Baba. Um, but I, I kind of had decided, um, even as I was finishing that, uh, the editing process of that novel with my, uh, with my editor, that I was going to write another novel set in Afghanistan, and that I was going to write a novel about Afghan women. I pretty much decided that as, as I was finishing The Kite Runner. Um, the Kite Runner dealt with uh, the, gen the, uh, the ethnic line, the socioeconomic line, the political line, the sectarian line, but it didn't deal a whole lot with the gender line. And that was something that, um, that I was aware of, but I felt that's something that really required its own space and its own time. Um, and I decided to choose... Um, I, I chose to write about Afghan women because I, both um, as an Afghan and as a writer, I could not think of a more riveting, of a more important, um, a more dramatic, more tragic, more re relevant, a more important story. Um, Afghan women, to put it in a not very subtle fashion, over the last... Uh, um, especially over the last 15 years, have struggled more um, than probably, um, or at least as much as any group in recent world history. They um, have been beaten. They have been uh, raped. They have been humiliated. They've been imprisoned. Um, Afghan women have been forced into marriage. Um, they've been forced into prostitution. They've been denied their fundamental human rights. The story of the struggle of Afghan women is an old and tortured one. It, it did not begin with the takeover of the Taliban, as is often the misconception. It predates by centuries the arrival of the Taliban the Taliban are merely the latest, if um, the most notorious and most um, loathsome offenders. Unfortunately, the image of the burqa-wearing Afghan woman uh, walking by the unforgiving stern glare of the Taliban official has become a, um, a common and um, familiar image around the world, and even iconic. Um, and it has led many people to, um, especially uh, feminists in the West, to take up the cause of uh, women's lib in Afghanistan. When I, was, uh, when I went back to Kabul in 2003, um, I saw for myself um, many of these women. And I spoke to many of them. And I remember... Um, wondering as they walked by, I remember kind of the novelist in me wondering, you know, who is the woman behind that veil? Who is she in person? You know, what are her thoughts? What are her dreams? Her disappointments? What are her hopes? You know, has she been in love before? Or has she um, been disappointed in life? What are her yearnings? This novel, in, in my own limited way, is my attempt to imagine answers to those questions. It's my attempt um, to explore the inner lives of at least two 
um, fictional women and um, to look for the humanity behind their veils. Um, I know that it may sound grandiose to say this, but I like to think of this novel, which has been almost three years in the making and has been truly, truly a labor of love for me. I like to think of this novel as um, my small tribute to the great endurance and the great courage and the great spirit of Afghan women, for whatever it's worth. Um, I am tremendously proud of this book. I'm terribly fond of it. It's dear to me. And I hope that you as readers um, are moved by this novel, that this story engages you in some fashion, that it maybe enlightens you, that it transports you, certainly. But I also hope that it leaves you with a sense of um, empathy for Afghan women and um, what they have been through over the last 30 years, especially the last 15, and what they have endured, and in many ways, what they continue um, to endure. Um, specifically, um, this novel is a story of two women. It's a story of two women who are born a generation apart. The older woman is named Mariam, and she is an uneducated, um, timid woman who is raised on the outskirts of a village in western Afghanistan. And she has, you know, very, very modest expectations from her life. The younger woman is named Laila, and she's born into a middle-class family in Kabul. She is a strong-willed, bright, um, very um, optimistic um, and ambitious young woman who looks forward to a life of both professional and um, personal fulfillment. Um, these two women are unexpectedly, unexpectedly brought together by circumstance and by fate and by tragedy, and they form a very special friendship, um, a very profound friendship that sees them through a decade or more of warfare, of anarchy, of oppression, extremism, and gender, and gender apartheid. Um, so A Thousand Splendid Sons is on the one hand a very intimate story of the human drama, of the friendship and the evolving relationship between these two women, these two very different women. And on the other hand, it's um, a, a chronicling uh, an accounting of the, of the cycles of loss and brutality uh, that have plagued Afghanistan for the last 30 years and have left millions of Afghans victimized, particularly um, Afghan women. I'm going to read you um, a passage from this novel, if I may. Um, the passage I'm going to read is about Maryam. In fact, it's the first chapter of this novel. Mariam, remember, is the older woman, and she's the older of the two central women in this character. Mariam is the um, illegitimate child of this embittered, disgraced, lowly housemaid uh, that Mariam calls Nana. And this um, powerful, um, very rich, and well-to-do, wealthy businessman who lives um, in the city of Herat, which is in western Afghanistan. Um, Mariam and Nana, her mother, live in a hut, in a shack, uh, on the outskirts of this village, outside the great city of Herat. And her father, whose name is Jalil, lives with his legitimate family, his three wives and his ten children, in the city of Herat, in a great big house. Despite uh, uh, the fact that um, Mariam and, and her mother are scorned and essentially cast out, Laila, uh, Mariam worships her father. She worships Jalil, and her entire childhood life revolves around the day of Thursday, which is the day of the week when Jalil comes from Herat and pays her a visit um, at the hut and brings her a small present and spends an hour or two with her. In her mind, um, 
Maryam entertains a life of living with Jalil. Um, she dreams of, of, of being a legitimate daughter to him and of living in his household um, as an accepted member of his family. But when she decides to pursue that dream, tragedy strikes and Maryam's life is altered forever. Um, so this is the first chapter of the novel. Uh, it's very self-explanatory. In this, uh, in, in this chapter, uh, Maryam is a child. Maryam was five years old the first time she heard the word Haromi. It happened on a Thursday. It must have because Maryam remembered that she'd been restless and preoccupied that day, the way she was only on Thursdays, the day when Jalil visited her at the shack. To pass the time until the moment that she would see him at last, Maryam had climbed the chair and taken down her mother's Chinese tea set. The tea set was a sole relic that Maryam's mother, Nana, had of her own mother, who had died when Nana was two. Nana cherished each blue and white porcelain piece, the graceful curve of the pot spout, the hand-painted finches and chrysanthemums, the dragon on the sugar bowl meant to ward off evil. It was this last piece that slipped from Mariam's fingers that fell to the wooden floorboards of the shack and shattered. When Nana saw the bowl, her face flushed red and her upper lip shivered and her eyes, both the lazy and the good, settled on Mariam in a flat, unblinking way. Nana grabbed Mariam by the wrists pulled her close, and through gritted teeth said, You're a clumsy little Haromi. This is my reward for everything I've endured? An heirloom-breaking clumsy little Haromi? At the time, Mariam did not understand. She did not know what this word Haromi, bastard, meant. Nor, nor was she old enough to appreciate the injustice to see that it is the creators of the Harami who are culpable, not the Harami, whose only sin is being born. Maryam did surmise, by the way Nana said the word, that it was an ugly, loathsome thing to be a Harami, like an insect, like the scurrying cockroaches Nana was always cursing and sweeping out of the shack. Later, when she was older, Maryam did understand. It was the way Nana uttered the word, not so much saying it as spitting it at her, that made Maryam feel the full sting of it. She understood then what Nana meant, that Harami was an unwanted thing, that she, Maryam, was an illegitimate person who would never have legitimate claim to the things that other people had, things such as love, family, home, and acceptance. Jalil never called Maryam this name. Jalil said she was his little flower. He was fond of sitting her on his lap and telling her stories like the time he told her that Herat, the city where Maryam was born in 1959, had once been the cradle of Persian culture and the home of writers, painters, and Sufis. You couldn't stretch a leg here without poking a poet in the ass, he laughed. Jalil told her the story of Queen Gauhar Shad, who had raised the famous minarets as her loving ode to Herat back in the 15th century. He described to her the green wheat fields of Herat, the orchards, the vines pregnant with plump grapes, the city's crowded vaulted bazaars. There's a pistachio tree, Jalil said one day, and beneath it 
Mariam Jo, is buried none other than the great poet Jami. He leaned in and whispered, Jami lived over 500 years ago. He did. I took you there once to the tree. You were little. You wouldn't remember. It was true. Mariam didn't remember. And though she would live the first 15 years of her life within walking distance of Herat, Mariam would never see the story tree. She would never see the famous minarets up close. And she would never pick fruit from Herat's orchards or stroll in its fields of wheat. But whenever Jalil talked like this, Mariam would listen with enchantment. She would admire Jalil for his vast and worldly knowledge. And she would quiver with pride to have a father who knew such things. What rich lies, what rich lies, Nana said after Jalil left. Rich man telling rich lies. He never, he never ever took you to any tree. And don't let him charm you. He betrayed us, your beloved father. He cast us out. He cast us out of his big fancy house like we were nothing to him. And he did it happily. Mariam would listen dutifully to this. She never dared say to Nana how much she disliked her talking this way about Jalil. The truth was that around Jalil, Mariam did not feel at all like a harami. For an hour or two every Thursday, when Jalil came to see her, all smiles and gifts and endearments, Mariam felt deserving of all the beauty and all the bounty that life had to give. And for this, Mariam loved Jalil, even if she had to share him. Jalil had three wives and nine children, nine legitimate children, all of whom were strangers to Mariam. He was one of Herat's wealthiest men. He owned a cinema, which Mariam had never seen. But at her insistence, Jalil had described it to her, and so she knew that the facade was made of blue and tan terracotta tiles, that it had private balcony seats and a trellis ceiling. She knew the double swinging doors opened into a tile lobby where posters of Hindi films were encased, encased in glass displays. On Tuesdays, Jalil said one day, kids got free ice cream at the concession stand. Nana smiled demurely when he said this. She waited until he had left the shack before snickering and saying, the children of strangers get ice cream. And what you get, Mariam? Stories of ice cream. In addition to the cinema, Jalil owned land in Karoch and land in Farah and three carpet stores, a clothing shop and a black 1956 Buick Roadmaster. He was one of Herat's best connected men, friend of the mayor and the provincial governor. He had a cook, a driver, and three housekeepers. Nanam had been one of the housekeepers until her belly began to swell. When that happened, Nana said, the collective gasp of Jalil's family all but sucked the air out of Herat. His in-laws swore blood would flow. The wives demanded that he throw her out. And Nana's own father, who was a lowly stone carver in the nearby village of Guldoman, disowned her. Disgraced, he packed his things and boarded a bus to Iran, never to be seen or heard from again. Sometimes, Nana said one early morning, as she was feeding the chickens outside the shack, sometimes I wish my father had had the stomach to sharpen one of his knives and do the honorable thing. It might have been better for me. She tossed another handful of seeds into the coop, paused, and looked at Mariam. And better for you too, maybe. It would have spared you the grief of knowing that you are what you are. But he was a coward, my father. He didn't have the del, the heart for it. Jalil didn't have the del either, 
Nana said, to do the honorable thing, to stand up to his family, to his wife, to his in-laws, and accept responsibility for what he'd done. Instead, behind closed doors, a face-saving deal had quickly been struck. The next day, Jalil had made her gather her things from the servants' quarters where she'd been living and sent her off. You know what he told his wives by way of defense? That I forced myself on him. That it was my fault. Did he? You see, this is what it means to be a woman in this world. Nana put on the bowl of chicken feed. She lifted Mariam's chin with a finger. Look at me, my Mariam. Reluctantly, Mariam did. And Nana said, Learn this, and learn it well, my daughter. Like a compass needle that points north, a man's accusing finger always finds a woman. Always. You remember that, Mariam. And that's the end of the first chapter, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, I understand there are a couple of mics. So for those brave souls who want to be the first ones to ask me any questions, I assure you I don't bite. And there's a, there's a man ready to ask a question. But there's a lady here first. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm, is it, is this on? Yes, ma'am, it's on. Uh, I'm facilitating a low vision book group in a retirement community near, in Stone Mountain. And when I discovered that the Kite Runner was on tape, I mentioned that book for them to read. And they loved it so much. I'm wondering if your new book is on tape yet, or um, if it's going to be. Yes, ma'am. It's already on tape. You know, I had, um, I read that first novel, um, and I, to uh, mixed results, perhaps. Um, and it was a, quite a learning experience, and it made me gain a whole lot of respect for people who read novels. And it was a, a grueling and um, difficult experience. I assure you that. I assure you of that. Um, but I felt that this second novel ought to be read by a lady. And so um, I asked um, an actress named Akusa Leone, who was one of the lead actresses in the Kite Runner movie if she would um, do me the honor of reading this novel uh, on audio. And as it turned out, she had the time to do it and the inclination, and so she did me the honor of reading this. So this book is read by Atusa Leone, um, who's um, uh, half Afghan, um, on audio. So you and your, uh, your friends can listen to this novel, and I hope you all enjoy it. And I thank you for uh, reading The Kite Runner Man. Thank you, and thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, before I, is it ready? It's on. We can hear you. Uh, before I begin my question, I just want to say as a fellow comp uh, compatriot that I salute you upon being a light upon my people. Thank my people. you. Uh, so my question is that uh, what inspired you to become a writer? Um, you know, I, I was a writer long, long before the thought of going to medical school ever even crossed my mind. Um, in, in that aspect, uh, the kite runner was uh, pretty autobiographical because I grew up like uh, this little boy, Amir, writing stories in Kabul. And I would write short stories and I would write little plays and, um, um, and I would like force my brothers and my sister to act in them. Um, so, and, you know, I, I, I don't know what it is that makes people want to write, um, but whatever it was, I kind of choo choose to believe in the romantic notion that I was born with that uh, compulsion. Uh, so I've never had any um, any choice but to write. I mean, I, it's been um, a compulsion of mine from the time that I could pick up a pen. Um, so it, it, it wasn't a decision to write. Uh, medicine was very much a decision. Um, I came to the States as an immigrant. Uh, my family was on welfare. And it was, a, it was a very conscious decision to go into a field that I felt was respectable, that I felt um, would secure me uh, professionally, economically for life. And so I went into medicine, and eventually, after a few years of practicing, I really began to love it. Um, but it was a process. <laughs>
It was a little bit like, um, you know, the, uh, the, the analogy that I've used in the past is uh, writing was like love at first sight. It's like your high school sweetheart. Um, but uh, medicine was like an arranged marriage. You know? <laughs> and after a few years, you're like, yeah, I, I really like that person, you know. So that's, what it, that's the way it was. But I, I, I was always writing. I would just never wrote to be published. And uh, that's what... That's what, how this is different, is that I, I wrote, um, eventually decided to be published. Yes. Thank you. Um, my, I'm glad you read chapter one because my question has to do with the role that women, uh, in this case the mothers, uh, played in also, um, I don't know if it's subjugating the women, but pl the extent that other women play in the role of also putting down women, and then in this case, um, you know, Miriam, Miriam's own expectations of her own life, um, how they sort of actually predicted or were in line with what happened to her, and the same with Layla, that what she um, wanted out of life, she eventually got, even though she had to endure much uh, to get there. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, um, I ought to look up who is the brilliant person who said this? Um, but there, I, I saw a quote in the San Francisco Chronicle roughly a month ago, well, less than that. And it uh, was by a, a writer, I don't remember who it was. And it said that the, um, the ideal tyranny is that which is self-administered by its victims. And uh, therefore, the perfect victims are those who unawarely and blissfully um, enslave themselves. And uh, it, it's, a, I think, a little arrogant for me to say that. Um, but I can't help but think it to some extent that if you are a, 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 a woman in um, rural Afghanistan and you are raised in an environment where men have ruled for centuries, where for generations and generations men have decided when you're going to marry, who you're going to marry, and incidentally, for how much? Um, that if you're a person raised in that environment of cultural and pervasive misogyny, um, that you're going to think that's just the normal way of things. And that therefore, your expectations of your own life are going to be different from somebody like Layla, who's raised in a middle class family whose father for essentially is a feminist. I mean, her father, you know, ex wants her to marry whoever she wants, when she wants. He expects her to finish high school, college, wants her to be a professional, and encourages her to pursue her, her dreams, her passions, her goals, her aspirations. So I, I think that um, um, I can never know fully, but I can't, as, as, as much as I want to respect culture, and custom and way of life and not impose my admittedly um, liberal slash progressive slash western slash naive sensibilities, you know, on the women who live in that region. I cannot help but think uh, that some of it is the men's doing and that they've got women brainwashed in a sense to think this way. That's a very crude and crass way of putting it, but it essentially comes down to what I'm trying to say. Hi. Um, the gentleman who introduced you explained the significance of your newest book, A Thousand Splendid Sons, and I was wondering if there's a connection between the reoccurring line in The Kite Runner, for you a thousand times over, and your newest title. The connection of the word 1,000, or of the number 1,000. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. Um, you know, that, that phrase, uh, th uh, for you a thousand times over, comes from you know, my, my Afghan um, 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 friends here will know, comes from an Afghan saying, and so I used it for that reason. Um, this um, title came from um, um, a line um, which I found in a poem by Saeb Tabrizi, a poet who... Um, that's kind of an interesting story. He um, was a Persian poet and lived under a very oppressive king um, who did not approve 
of artistic and cultural expression, certainly not of poetry. And so he uh, went, on, went in exile and of all places found acceptance and reverence and love and companionship in Kabul. And the governor in Kabul loved him and loved his poetry and he fell in love with Kabul. And um, when he went back to modern-day Iran near modern-day Isfahan, he, uh, eventually he went back there, but he wrote these beautiful poems about Kabul. And I, and I found um, this poem, um, um, which is not the literal translation, the English is not the literal translation of the Farsi, um, the Farsi verses, but I found it, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it would fit in perfectly in the scene that I was trying to use. Uh, and I thought it would, wow, I, I found my title. Initially, this novel was going to be called Dreaming in Titanic City. Um, and uh, everybody asked me, what happened to Dreaming in Titanic City? Um, what happened is that it was published, um, but it, just under a different title. And I thought this was a better title. But I, I you know, I, I didn't. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. In the Kite Runner, how much of the book did you draw from personal experiences in Afghanistan? Um, well, I mean, I, it, it, I am not a mirror, and, um, you know, I've had a hard time convincing people of that. <laughs> you know, we, uh, unfortunately have had, um, some, um, so-called memoirs who turn out really to be novels, um, in the last few years, and I found myself in the bizarre position of writing a novel that I cannot convince people is not a memoir. <laughs> so... I am not a mirror. Um, that said, I, it's uh, first novels tend to be very much. Um, where'd you go? <laughs> Raise your hand so I can see you. There you are. So uh, first novels tend to be. Um, you can sit down. I just wanted to make. I <laughs> first novels tend to be um, autobiographical. I think by necessity, because a writer sits down and they. Uh, it's instinct to draw from your own life. And in that regard, I was no different. I mean, the, there's quite a lot more of me in that novel than there is in A Thousand Splendid Sons. I mean, I, I, um, I grew up like Amir in Kabul in the 70s. I came from a very similar socioeconomic background. I was a writer when I grew up. I loved to read. I came to the States as an immigrant. Um, the, all the passages in Kite Runner about Amir and Baba and the two of them driving around in that van up and down, you know, East Bay and going to the flea market. That's verbatim for my life. Um, so there, there are large passages of it which are so-called autobiographical, and if you want to put it that way. But the storyline itself is imagined. And I, um, um, you know, I think it's very hard to write novels from a total vacuum. You ultimately have to connect your story to something that feels real to you, that either you have experienced or have seen or somebody that you know has experienced or seen. There has to be some connection to reality uh, to, or to something that feels genuine. Um, and to that extent, I think that novel, um, there's a lot more of me on the pages of The Kite Runner than on the pages of the second novel, which, uh, and for that reason, I, I think that this, I I'm in, in some way feel like this second novel is, is more of a, an accomplishment for that reason, because I didn't have that crutch of falling onto my own life uh, and falling back on it and just kind of trying to remember my own childhood. You know, here I really, I really had to will this novel into being. Um, and so, anyway, so it's, it's, uh, I, think, I think a lot of novels, especially first novels, work out that way. Yes, ma'am. You're going to monopolize the left mic, okay. <laughs> we don't have a long line No, we don't, it's true. <laughs> what happened to the movie, The Kite Runner? I was waiting for it to come out last Christmas. No, no, it, um, uh, no, it finished shooting last Christmas. Um, but, you know, films have to be going post-production and there has to be special effects and all this good stuff. But it finished shooting uh, last December um, and it's in post-production now. So somebody's composing music, and somebody's adding special effects, and they're fixing the dialogue, and all this good stuff. This should be out in November um, of this year. And it'll probably be it'll probably premiere in some festivals in in Europe before that, 
but it'll be, I think, last I heard, will be in limited release November 2nd in the States, and just kind of expand from there, and by Christmas it should be in wide release. Yeah. I'll come back to you in a minute. Yes. <laughs> My name is Mustafa. I'm 14, and I really want to go into writing as I get older, so what advice would you give to somebody who wants to explore that field? Um... You know, I, I wish I had a, an incredibly sexy and useful uh, piece of advice to give you. Um, I don't, other than please write and read. Um, you know, I, I, there really isn't. I mean, all, you know, people will go on and on and on and on about this stuff, and you wait and you listen. At the end of it, it boils down to the same thing. Make sure you write all the time and make sure you read. Um, you have to read all the time. That I, I do think is very helpful. You can't, I mean, it, um, there's a movie that came out uh, six, seven years ago called Quills, and it's about the, the, uh, the, the Marquis de Sade who was imprisoned in um, uh, Napoleonic era France, and he was this writer of pornography, and he wrote all these incredibly lurid books, uh, which of course offended um, um, people, and he was imprisoned. And they, they threw him in the jail, and he kept writing. And so they took away his pens and his paper, and he kept writing. And they took everything away, and he kept writing. And he would cut his wrist, and he would use blood to write. And they assigned this priest um, to save his soul, uh, to talk to some sense of this, to the marquee. And the, the priest, uh, I remember this scene in the film, the priest says, um, but why don't you, listen, why don't you just read something for a change? And he's like feverishly writing and he turns around and he goes, I don't have time to read, man. You know? And the priest says, uh, the true mark of an amateur writer, the writer who produces more than he reads. And so I think um, you have to read in order to write. Um, you have to read people that you want to like, uh, whose genre you admire, whose style you admire. And you have to write all the time and you have to make your mistakes, you have to develop your style, your voice. Um, and be open to people reading your no you reading your stories and be open to criticism um, and have a thick skin have a very very thick skin and there's a lot of rejection in being a writer a whole lot of it and if and if you're not ready to accept that you'll have a hard time you have to just it's it's not personal it's business you know have a thick skin but write all the time write every day um, okay. I'll take your question, and then I'll take the gentleman's question. Okay. Um, I did live in Afghanistan for three years. I was in Peace Corps, and um, my group gets together about every three or four years, and we eat Afghan food and talk about it. Your Peace Corps group? Yeah. Okay. And we all found Afghanistan delightful and joyful, and, and the spirit of people not only they have a large sense of acceptance, but they also have a, a large sense of joy and delight and uh, the storytelling and the laughter and, and pride in just you know, individual things and the ability to sew and to, to embroider and all that. I'm what, I miss, uh, we all loved your novel, but we also miss that element uh, being expressed in either the, your novel or many of the things that are coming out about Afghanistan. Um, is there any more of that in this book? Um, and is there any other things that you could recommend that would be able to share that with other people? Um, well, you know, I mean, I, um, I mean, you'll have to be the judge of whether you find um, uh, your personal experiences in this novel or not, ultimately. That's, um, that's up to you to decide. Um, but you, um, you might find um, there's a book called, um, well, I, have, you know, I feel hypocritical recommending it, but I've heard so many wonderful things about Rory Stewart's book, The Places in Between, and I haven't read it yet. So I can't personally recommend it. But from what I've heard, it's really wonderful, and it, it talks a lot about the things that you mentioned. Um, Christine, Christina Lamb's book, um, called The Sewing Circles of Herat, I think to a large degree addresses, I mean, captures some of that. Um, and I mean, a lot of it is, is set in Herat, which is, you know, a beautiful, wonderful city. Um, 
Jason Elliott's book, um, An Unexpected Light, I think, to some degree addresses that as well. I don't know if you read that book. But I, you know, my novels, um, you know, I, I think they do, they do address those things. But, um, you know, um, you know I, 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 I love writing tension. I, write, I love writing conflict. I'm, I'm addicted to forwarding the story and to getting the reader, um, getting the reader's attention, and so that may be some of it. But and I hope you find that this this novel does have some of that those elements. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. I just want to thank you for the kite runner. I loved it. It, uh, it brought you. me back to my travels in uh, Afghanistan. I was there in uh, March 2002 on a medical mission. Ah. And okay. uh, it was uh, I was in the privileged position of as a practitioner to, to see many of the women lift their yeah, yeah. burqas and yeah. to see all the amazing faces and uh, um, it's an amazing country. I've traveled many places and it's a remarkable place. But I was curious with this new book, the characters, uh, were ethnically, what are they? Are they Zara, Pashtun? Well, the characters um, in this novel are diverse. Um, Mariam is a, you know, she's uh, Herat, Herat is a largely a Tajik town, so she's from that ethnicity. And um, it's largely what? It's a Tajik town. It's Tajik, yeah. Yes. Um, but I, I, the, the ethnic uh, divide does not play as much of a role in this novel, and I, to some conscious level, try to stay away from that because I felt that that would overshadow a lot of things. It's always relevant. Um, it certainly always relevant to people's politics, as I'm sure you know, um, and um, and I had to be conscious of that. Um, but I didn't want it to uh, overtake the story, and to some, uh, um, I mean, I, I addressed that to a great degree in Kite Runner, but it's a much lesser issue in uh, in this novel. But but I, but as you read it, the characters and their their Pashtun characters, their Hazara characters. Uh, and, and both good and bad and from all walks of life. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Um, first of all, thanks. Um, millions of readers are indebted for you to uh, choosing to take a second wife and uh, as it relates to your career. So oh, you. <laughs> you scared me for a second. <laughs> Man. <laughs> For marrying your teenage I'm 42 years old. Sense. For all I know, my coronary is a block. Don't do that to me. <laughs> uh, my question is a rather self-serving one as one of the earlier ones, too, and that is uh, if you could speak just a moment regarding the process of your, your writing discipline and the nuts and bolts of your writing discipline when you were still you know, practicing yeah. full-time and writing in your tired hours, and what advice would you have to uh, writers who are, who are at that particular stage, still trying to give their, their tired hours to the craft. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for your question. Thank you for waiting. Um, you know, it's, um, I wrote, um, I mean, ultimately, I think you have to have a subject matter, a story, a character, a situation that is so compelling that you cannot imagine not writing it. And that even if you didn't want to write it, you'd have to find time to do it. Um, you, you really have to be that invested in it. Uh, when I when I was writing the Kite Runner, um, I you know I, I I I had these two boys in mind, and I love the contrast between the boys and how one of them was so cause just blindly loyal to the other one, and the other one wasn't always deserving of it. And I felt uh, I you know I loved that, and I and I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and, and find, that, find out. And so, you know, I was working full-time as a doctor then, and so I would get up around 4.30, 5 in the morning, and I would write for about three hours. Uh, and the house was quiet, it was dark, I had seclusion, I had, and that happened to be a very creative time for me. Um, and, I, and I was very productive. And I wrote till about 8, and then I shaved and got dressed and went and saw my patients. And then the next day I did it all over again. Um, um, with this second novel, um, I still got up early, but then I wrote longer because I eventually, after about a year and a half, I went on sabbatical for medicine and I began writing full time. Um, but the novel is, um, 
writing a novel, and I don't know if your question was about writing novels, but writing a novel is largely an act of perseverance. Uh, I think a lot of novels die around the 50-page mark uh, because it's always very sexy to start a novel. You know, you're starting a novel. It's great. It's, it's, it's exciting. And then you actually get to a point where you actually have to write that, that sucker. You know? <laughs> and that's where novels die. You know, it becomes a, a very, uh, a, a matter of, um, you know, checking in and checking out every single day of weathering those days where you'd rather be anywhere else but writing that book, uh, and of realizing that there are some, there are going to be some incredibly frustrating days, uh, and days where you're going to stare at the screen for hours and nothing happens. Um, and that's how novels end up in a, in a, in, in a drawer, end up collecting dust. Um, so if you're going to write a novel, you just understand you're in it for the long term. It's like a marriage, you know. Uh, it's not like a, you know, writing short stories is a bit like having a fling. Um, <laughs> but writing novels is like being married. You've got to take the good days with the bad and realize that it's all worth it in the end. And so um, that was a lesson that I learned from writing The Kite Runner that served me very, very well, I have to say, very well in the writing of the second novel. I don't say that uh, lightly. It, it really saved my skin, uh, to, especially since I was kind of writing in a kind of a pressure cooker environment, largely self-made, of knowing that people were actually reading my first novel and they were expecting a second novel. And, um, and I just, having gone through it, uh, it really helped me writing uh, the second novel. So I think the key is just perseverance. Um, and this is not my quote, and this is no comment on my part about poetry. This is Stephen King's comment. But he, I read an interview with him one time in one of the magazines, and he said, you know, any clown can write a line of poetry, but only a, uh, a persevering clown can write a novel. <laughs> so. I want to take one more question. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say assalamu alaikum first, and I'm a big fan. And my question has to do specific to the characters and the kite runner. Mm -hmm. And to what extent does Hassan serve as almost as like an ideal character or a force that antagonizes or propels Amir into the conflict? And like what extent is he an actual person that we're supposed to analyze? Because I know you reference him through religious imagery during the rape scene and like, so what extent should we analyze him as a real human and what extent should we analyze him as like an ideal image created? Um, uh, are you in school now? <laughs> what grade are you in? Um, I'm going into a freshman in college. Okay. Um, well, I, 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 it is always with some degree of trepidation that I approach <laughs> students because I, uh, I always get the toughest questions. <laughs> Read the ones that actually require the most thought from the writer. <laughs> from students like yourself, so thank you for putting thought into it. Um, you know, I, I always uh, thought as a kite runner, um, as this, um, you know, kind of this, this story of good and evil, where Hassan was on one end of the spectrum and the bad guy was on, Asaf was on the other end of the spectrum. Um, you know, and I, and, I, and I saw it as a morality tale with Amir kind of our vehicle into that story and, and, and as a very kind of undecided vehicle. You know, he doesn't know where he fits into that spectrum. Um, Hassan's here and Asaf's here and Amir feels or fears that he has elements of this. He would like to be more like Hassan. And so I, you know, it's not for me to say for you to read these, as, these characters as real people I certainly thought of them. I mean, I can answer you for myself. I thought of them as real people. They were real to me. I mean, I lived with them for 15 months. Um, they became very much real to me, just like the women in this novel became real to me. Um, but ultimately, it's up to you to decide whether they're convincing enough to be real and whether you think of them as real or you think of them as archetypes in a parable kind of setting. And ultimately, that's, um, you know, that's... the that depends on the flavor in which you read the novel.
Um, but I certainly, I certainly thought of these characters as real. Uh, I meant for them to be realistic, but it's um, ultimately up to you. Um, okay, Jack, I think I'm going to sit over here and sign your books, but I really do want to um, um, make sure I thank you. Thank you so very much for showing up to hear me uh, speak, for reading The Kite Runner. Hope you enjoy the second novel. Thank you. <laughs>